Good afternoon and welcome to our seminar on rural business and fi business finance. Um, first of all, I'd like to run through the aim objectives and one or two um, background elements. Um, obviously, the aims are to identify the main types of finance available to businesses and consider some of the key factors affecting them. I'd like to point out today's session will be recorded and available on the website in due course. Um, and there is a Q&A uh, bar which is available to you. And please post questions into that Q&A as you're going along. And we will endeavour to answer as many of those as we can at the end of the session. Today's panel consists of uh, Matthew Smart, who is the founder and chief executive of Rural Asset Finance and Rural Asset Management Services. And they provide finance directed to UK farm-based businesses for equipment, property and diversification projects. Matthew is a farmer's son from a mixed arable and beef farm farming family in Cambridgeshire, who graduated university and entered BNP Paribus Lease Group as a graduate trainee in the 1990s. Since 2001, Matthew has founded and managed various agricultural lenders supporting UK farmers, and he's built a team of loyal SME client base, which includes the most productive and entrepreneurial farmers um, in the UK and landowners um, by using his niche knowledge and the team's niche knowledge and grassroots understanding of farmers, um, various financing needs. And they've evolved over the last 25 years um, of operation. And Tom Stone, who is director in the Albert Goodman Accountants Farm and Estates team, Tom is a chartered accountant and acts for a wide variety of farming clients. He regularly leads financing advice to, to farming businesses, helping to add value to both existing and new clients on top of the conventional compliance related accountancy work. That work can range from helping existing clients refinance their debt to more significant borrowing arrangements, such as facilitating a, far, a purchase of a farm. Tom enjoys thinking outside the box and is regularly involved in both income and capital planning for his farm and landed estate clients. Okay. Yes. Hand over to Tom for an introduction. Brilliant. Well, thanks, Duncan, for that kind introduction and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think before going into the different types of finances, their uses, advantages, disadvantages, it was worth just touching on a couple of slides, which the next few are going to do, just to provide a little bit of background on what farming um, and land of the states businesses need finance for. Um, when I've done these sort of talks in the past, um, often often in person, I, I've often gone around the room or tried to do some sort of poll um, to see what people view the various different aspects um, on on the slides here um, would, would would want to finance um, it with, um, and then do the same at the end to see whether perceptions have changed. Um, I think ultimately the the view of the presentation over the next sort of forty five minutes or so um, is to provide an overview of the different tools which are available to you um, to sort of help you. Um, finance the various needs um, on, on, on the screen. Um, so perhaps Duncan, if we go on to, on to the next slide, um, that, that would be great. Um, before going on to the different types, I think it's always worth us um, revisiting why financings and the consideration of, of the type of lending um, rates and all those sort of things are more important than ever. Um, if we think back three, four years ago, um, the Bank of England base rate was 0.1 of a percent um, and interest rates really were in the back of everybody's minds and, and nobody was really paying too much attention um, to, to, to the rates that they were being offered. If we fast forward to where we are today, um, we've got a Bank of England base rate of, of five and a quarter um, percent. And for those on, on variable rate loans and, and other um, variable rate um, offerings, then they have seen a substantial um, increase in, in, in their sort of monthly outgoings. Um, and that has put a lot of strain on, on people. Um, and also for new opportunities, so new investments, like on that past slide where we were looking at the diversification, so the building of a holiday let, um, the purchase of a farm, it really means that interest cost is now a really, really important part of that investment appraisal um, when we're considering um, new, new ventures. Um, 
what this sort of slide here um, illustrates, I suppose, is, is the path to the future um, to get us to what that new normal might be. Um, you can see here, there are sort of two illustrations. Um, one, um, the blue line um, being the thoughts at November, um, and one, the green line um, being the thoughts at the start of February. Um, and I'm sure off the back of the budget um, last, last week, then these paths would have changed again. Um, but I think what they illustrate um, and both do is a reduction in, in, in interest rates. Um, obviously, as you can see here, a, a quite a big contrast on how quickly that's going to happen and what that new normal is going to be. Um, I think speaking to local bank managers, economists um, at talks recently, um, there's a there's a strong consideration that the green line um, is, is the more likely um, line and likely exit um, with the new normal being somewhere between sort of three and a quarter, three and a half um, in the future. Um, and the budget sort of backed that up, I suppose. Um, last week, the OBR um, announced that there was growth in the UK economy after a slight recession last year, um, which is positive. Um, and it also showed inflation coming below the government's target, um, which should mean that the Bank of England start to reduce base rates as time goes on. Um, our next review is, is the 21st of March, um, whether we see a reduction there or whether it starts to become later in the year, sort of quarter three, quarter four, time will tell on, time will tell on that, um, but, but certainly indicating that rates will, will start to come down, but at their current rates, and it's always important to understand um, the impacts of changes um, on, on you. So Duncan, back to you to, to have a look at some of the tools on offer. Great, thank you, Tom. Right, well, we'll start with um, overdrafts, which are um, a very common um, thing amongst most businesses. Um, it's normal for cash flow in a business to change in different situations, um, and some of those changes might actually be out of management control. So overdrafts provide an additional line of credit that gives you that short-term cash flow solution, allowing businesses to borrow money using their current account, and essentially enabling you to have more money to be spent than is actually in your account. It's important to remember, though, that overdrafts should not be viewed as a long-term funding solution. They are a short-term credit facility. They're a form of loan, but they are repayable on demand. And I'll touch on that in a, in a minute, too. Um, essentially, what it means is that you should always have enough money to make sure you or the ability to raise sufficient funds to repay that loan should you need to, that overdraft should you need to. Unlike business loans, <clears throat> which come with fixed repayments and fixed interest rates, a business overdraft charges interest only on the amount of money by which you're overdrawn. So they are more flexible on that basis. And you can pay back a business overdraft as and when your cash flow allows. Although, as I said, it's important to remember that the bank can demand repayment at any time if they wish to. So what are the benefits of using an overdraft? They have a high rate of approval, so it's usually very quick. Typically, um, most businesses be able to arrange an overdraft without or with very few issues and very quickly. Um, the process of getting that business overdraft is straightforward. And very often, it's simply a matter of discussing these with the bank, either in person, on the phone or online. And you can pay off that debt as and when your cash flow allows. On some occasions, your bank might demand the repayment, but usually, as we say, um, you'll be able to repay it um, if you borrowed. And if they do, rather than re demand repayment of that overdraft, what most banks will do, unless the business is clearly in near terminal decline, is they will look to transfer what they would refer to as hard core of the overdraft to a loan um, to allow the business to afford that borrowing more readily. Loans tend to have a, a lower interest rate um, and it's, it's a much cheaper way of borrowing overall um, and the banks tend to like that if you've got a, a level of overdraft that you're not clearing on, a, on a, at least on an annual basis. What are the risks of overdraft? Um, obviously, you've got charges. Uh, if you're late with repayments, you miss all together, your banks might charge you a, a fee. Higher interest rates generally have much higher or considerably higher by a percentage point or two than business loans and other forms of secured borrowing. And as I said, they are repayable on demand. 
So an overdraft isn't free, and there is that annual interest rate that you'll pay on the amount you're overdrawn. You'll have an arrangement fee, usually um, every year, um, that you'll, you'll have to pay an arrangement fee. And the interest rate will vary between banks, and it will also depend on the, the perceived strength of the business that you're running and the credit rating of your business. Typically, rates for overdrafts are, as I said, higher than for business loans. Um, so hence the reason they're considered a short-term facility. Right, okay. And I think at that point, I'll hand over to Tom, who will look at, from an accountant's perspective, um, yeah, thanks, Duncan. Yeah, um, yeah. I think overdrafts one are pretty fundamental um, to both farming and, and landed estates businesses, um, and therefore are a really key tool um, when when it comes to being able to operate. Um, ultimately, farms and landed estate businesses have got a lot of cash tied up, um, whether that be in stock um, or in machinery outside drilled into the ground whatever it may be and therefore having that working capital facility um, is, is really useful um, from year to year month to month um, tax benefits wise um, of course you get um, tax relief on the interest and the arrangement fees you you incur um, and that overdraft is a liability um, of the business um, so if your business isn't that of a trading business then it does reduce the value of the overall business um, for IHT purposes, which can be useful um, in some circumstances. Um, I think from a commercial perspective, what to watch out for, um, Duncan alluded to earlier, um, that hardcore um, and, and probably what we mean by that, and, and you see this a lot in, in sort of farm sets of accounts, is you may look at um, the farm accounts year to year or even on a five year summary and, and you see a, a business overdraft at 150, 150,000, 150,000, 150,000. Um, and therefore, I think from a, a banking perspective, they would very much view that as an interest only loan, um, potentially. Um, and that's where they, they view that as being that hardcore um, element, um, which Duncan says they can sometimes put pressure on to then look to, to refinance that away um, onto a loan. Um, I think one thing that's been quite fundamental over the last 12 months as well with, well, last 12 to 24 months, I suppose, with, with ag inflation, so inflation up to 35% for some farming businesses, um, that has meant a massive increase in, in working capital um, and therefore trying to plan ahead as much as you can do um, because if your working capital needs to go up by 35 percent then your bank overdraft may need to go up by 35 percent um, or somewhere around somewhere around those numbers and therefore it's important to plan ahead with your bank manager get an understanding of the cap the working capital needs um, and to do that with as much time as possible um, as Duncan said it is easier to, to, to get an extension on, on your overdraft than maybe to go for a, a whole new business loan. Um, but what we are seeing from, from, from high street banks is they're wanting more and more information on when that overdraft is going to reduce back down to its original level. Um, and then lastly, which probably leads on to, to my next slide, Duncan, um, if you're okay to move across, I think it's thinking about how cheap actually is your overdraft as a facility. Um, and on the screen here, I've got two examples. So the middle column um, is, is an overdraft um, and looking at the cost on year one and then the total cost from having it for, for 10 years. Um, and the right hand column is looking at a loan and the total loss, the total cost of that interest only loan over 10 years. Um, if we just focus on, on that 10 year column, um, we'll see overdraft, a cost of 150,000 versus a loan, a cost of 124,000. Um, and the reason for that for that difference um, in, in, in costing um, are the annual arrangement fees that you pay on your overdraft. So linking back to that hardcore element earlier, if you do have a hardcore element of your business overdraft, then sometimes being on an interest only loan or a business loan, which Matthew will touch on um, in a moment, can be a better, cheaper option for your business, um, depending on the circumstances. And as Duncan mentioned earlier here, I've just done it, um, done the illustration as the as the interest rate on either an overdraft, the loan being the same. Um, you can often see a loan being cheaper potentially um, than an overdraft as well, making that gap um, much bigger. 
so that this, the key takeaway I think from from the overdraft is it's a fundamental um, fundamental source of finance for your farming business. It's being careful on on that hardcore element and how much of it remains year to year, um, and therefore being mindful of whether it's right that you do have that hardcore element or whether a loan or another tool could be useful um, for looking at financing it. So back over to I think it's to Matthew now to have a look at unsecured loans. Oh, yes, thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just touching, well, taking up the mantle on the unsecured loans, it, it's not a huge, um, hugely pro popular product with the agricultural community, uh, tend to go to more secured loans, but, but the unsecured loans are available from banks and uh, finance companies. Traditionally, obviously not taking security, um, there's a quicker process uh, than a secured loan, but the amounts on offer and the structures available tend to be quite uh, um, small and restrictive. So typical unsecured facilities, we see at 25, occasionally 50,000 um, pounds, driven by a very uh, automated credit process with, within the, the lending institution. Uh, point to note, we see this where, where maybe facilities are already in place with a with a lender and then an unsecured loan is taken, there still could be guarantees or debentures if there's a company involved. Uh, they may still be required or they may be in play at the background, in the background. So an unsecured loan may not be as unsecured as first um, as it first looks. There are some advantages. Um, we could flip the slides, Duncan, thank you. The, the advantages are obviously unsecured so there's no security given that makes the process very quick so within a week sometimes but normally one to three weeks is a normal time scale and purely the underwriting process is is very automated these days within um within most lenders because of the smaller amounts of money uh, that are on offer um useful for smaller projects so um working capital injections, smaller projects, um, and there are limited costs, so small or no fees to set up. And obviously there's no legal or valuation process, which again adds time and uh, extra cost to the facilities. These are quite useful for tenant farmers or people who have limited security or complex security, um, which is, is difficult to unlock. Disadvantages, because they're unsecured facilities, they typically to have carry higher interest rates than secured loans, and usually the parameters for repayment is is quite fixed and and structured by the lender. So normally, monthly payments only, maximum term typically five years. They're quite rigid, um, with no flexibility. Over to you, Tom. I think so. Yeah, fabulous. Yeah, I don't have a huge much more to add. I don't think on on secured loans. Um, I think the com it's not particularly a common source of finance, as, as Matthew alluded to. Um, it can be useful, especially for maybe new entrants when they don't have the security, tenant farmers, those sorts of those sorts of proprietors. Um, but as as Dun as Matthew sorry alluded to. Um, a minute ago, um, it's really key to watch out for the terms on these. Yes, they may be unsecured, but actually, are they unsecured? Are they actually taking a personal guarantee, a director's guarantee um, on the loans going through? So I think it's important to to really understand what you're signing up for um, when when you're looking at these types of types of arrangements and, and finance packages. So I think I'm back to you, Matthew. For... Okay. So the, the, the more common product used in agriculture um, is the secured loans. So traditionally, traditional security would be taken to support the loan. This is normally commercial property or other assets with defined value. So not just uh, land and buildings with security. Um, we've got a first charge and a second charge. So second charge products are, we're seeing more, uh, more common now where there's a historic first charge lender on the farm, um, maybe from historic land purchases or, or being used as overdrafts. And you don't want to upset that lending relationship or also the facilities that are in place. So having a second charge product 
to fund, say, a diversification or a new facility is, is becoming quite common uh, these days. Um, guarantees and debentures do come into play. We see more and more now the land or the security being offered in a family partnership or um, owned individually, whereas the loan required is in a limited company, which is a, the trading entity of the farm. So that's quite common these days to, to lend to a limited company, but take security from uh, the, the proprietor's uh, land. When a lender, when we, when we review a secured loan or try to assess it, the advance rate and the pricing, there are two main factors that we look at. And I suppose it's good to drill into a bit of detail here because things have moved over the last 10 years. And now as a lender, particularly a regulated uh, lender, we, we have to go straight to an affordability analysis. Um, the principal tool for that is a debt service cover ratio or debt um, DSCR, DSR. It's called various things, but the, the simple ratio of um, operating income coming in, how does that cover the debt service, the current debts, which would be lease rentals, lease repayments, um, interest on overdrafts, for example, and then capital and interest repayments on HPs um, and other loans. So how much cash is coming in on an annual basis to then service the existing um, commitments. And the ratio of one to one obviously means there's enough, there's enough money coming in to service the existing commitment. So if we add a new commitment onto that with the new line, how does that affect the ratio? And this, this um, lenders do start to price according to debt service cover. So this is an important factor to get over. This ratio is crucial to the pricing. So um, a business that can show two times debt service cover, i.e. there's twice as much income coming in as, as uh, repayments going out, then that pricing starts to come right back to a lower level, as opposed to another borrower who may be on a one-to-one -one, um, ratio. The other thing we battle with on a day-to-day -day basis is unfortunately farmers fall foul of this test because the income for a five, for a year does not obviously doesn't always match the repayments which are going out um, at the same time. So so particularly with seasonal or um, potatoes is a fine example where they're kept in store over maybe eighteen months. Where whereas so the income does not sit in a calendar year or a financial year against the debt repayments. So um, we try to average out, um, which is why you'll often be asked for three years worth of accounts. So we can look at debt service cover over a three year period because a specialist lender to agriculture does realize that things don't sit in nice columns on an annual basis to do these tests. So we, we now try to look at a three year debt service cover average or even a five year if it's um, uh, something like potatoes or or other volatile uh, products. It's an important note. Uh, we also try and assess or look for in the accounts which are providing the operating income. Are there are there are all the income streams included? So it's common these days to have buy to you know that let properties or holiday income or gam or ca uh, camping or, or tourism income, which may not be shown in the main farm account. So. We may need to bring in other income streams in order to give a proper assessment of operating income. So this, this provides, I would say, three quarters, 75% of the work we do as a lender is, is on this on, is on this slide. Um, what used to be most important, but but now really it really isn't, is 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 the loan to value ratio. This, this does this does drive pricing. Uh, but is not the main driver over the affordability assessment. So um, different lenders have different views on um, quality of security, and it's normally around historic value 
uh, volatility. Um, we're lucky in, in agriculture that farmland and farm property doesn't have a lot of downside price volatility like other industries. Um, if anything, prices seem to push on uh, upwards uh, without much downside uh, volatility. So um, higher loan to values can be obtained in the agricultural market compared to other in other industries. So typically under 75% loan to value, good competitive pricing can be obtained. And if you're down at the 50, 55% loan to value, then top pricing, you know, the lowest pricing can be obtained. But there's more creep up to the higher sort of 70% loan to value now is not um is not uncommon. The other interesting point here is that where farm buildings are included in the security being offered and evaluation is is take, is is um is undertaken. Older farm buildings, um, not fit for modern farming, uh, are now actually driving higher values in evaluation because of their potential under class under the class Q planning rules. So whereas historically we've seen old farm buildings pulling down a farm valuation because of ongoing maintenance costs um, and, and repair, those old buildings are now driving higher valuations because of their potential to change to holiday lets or um, or, or small business lets. Um, advantages and disadvantages of the secured loans. Um, the main advantages are there's one piece of security given. It takes time to put in place, but multiple facilities can then be structured over a long period of time. So it's a one-off event to put the security in place, but then a, an interest-only facility could be put in place or a 10-year loan for a building or a 30-year loan to buy more land. So there's various facilities can, that use the same security. The loan balances tend to be larger as compared to the unsecured and the facilities are more flexible. So most lenders, you know, we're listening to the borrower of how they want to be, how they want to repay, how they want to structure the debt, um, a mixture of interest only and repayment, a mixture of fixed and variable, a mixture of terms that really there's an open book there um, with, with a secured farm loan. Interest rates are cheaper than unsecured lending. Um, the disadvantages are obviously upfront costs and, and a, a few weeks of time to put the security in place. There are arrangement fees, the valuation and, and some legal, legal fees. Um, these can be rolled into the loan, so it's not necessarily a cash um, outlay because part of the loan can be used for the setup. Um, the reason the process takes longer than an unsecured loan is because of that detailed credit analysis. So mainly on the, the, the DSCR um, analysis over time. And we're looking backwards three or five years um, to try and take meaningful averages. But also if the loan is for uh, some future diversification or a new income stream to the farm, we can take forecasts and produce forward looking DSCR tests as, as well to affordability tests, which which um which are useful. This takes a bit more time. Over to you, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, so I think just a few sort of insight points from, from me. Um, I think firstly, covenants. Um, see a lot now with both land estates and farming businesses where covenants, which are what the bank can put, can put on um, loans to, to sort of keep a check on you um, year to year. Um, and, 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 and so a couple I've seen are timings of accounts. So making sure that accounts are with the lender um, within a certain period um, of the year end. Often not one you see in force, but I've started to see people ask questions more, more and more um, to make sure make sure that is 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 done. Um, and the other one is back to that um, debt service ratio, um, which Matthew was talking about a moment ago. Is particularly on some of my land and estate clients, I've seen them 
seen a covenant in there, so a yearly thing they need to hit um, in, in terms of what ratio they want to see from all of the consolidated estate accounts. Um, so something we always have to be mindful of um, and the estate as well to ensure that these covenants are being met each year um, so that the bank can default them or try and um, put it put the loan in, into into review um, off, off the back of it. So important things, I think, to understand in, in the detail um, of your loan offers and arrangements that that you've got in, in place. Um, security and tax benefits, I think security wise, um, I'm always keen on my clients not having their farmhouses um, secured um, on, on their business loans. Um, I think it's always good to have the flexibility of that being away from the business borrowings. Of course, needs must if it's to get you over the line on a loan to value um, calculation, then you have to do what you have to do. Um, but to me, most of the time, there is a sufficient security um, in place to keep those loan to value numbers down to, to achieve the best pricing you can. Um, so trying to keep your own home out of that is, is always useful. Um, in terms of the tax benefits of secured loan, um, of course, you have your interest in the range fees that I mentioned earlier with the overdraft which are tax deductible. Um, the loans also reduce your, your capital assets for inheritance tax purposes so if you do have chargeable assets within your partnership um, or, or whatever vehicle you trade within then it can reduce um, that business worth which can be useful um, circumstance to circumstance. Um, other things to, to watch out for, um, which I see with, with, with some of my clients, um, is actually what you're being offered. Um, so often um, a, a bank may offer you a 20 year loan, um, but only commit for 10 years. Um, and what that means really is they're giving you a 10 year loan um, amortized over 20 years. Um, so at the end of 10 years, you're going to have to renegotiate what you're doing. Um, so therefore, it's always important to compare apples with apples um, rather than apples with pears to make sure when you're looking at different offers you've got um, in place, you're understanding the future costs that you may have to incur from, from a renegotiation um, point of view. Um, and I think the other big consideration has been for the last um, probably 36 months or so is, is fixed versus variable um, and making sure your business isn't exposed um, to big in increases in interest rates. Um, as, I, as I mentioned right at the start, um, interest rates have risen um, a huge amount over the past 24 months um, and that has put a lot of farming and land estate businesses under a, a huge amount of pressure. Um, and therefore, trying to manage your interest rate risk um, is quite an important part. And that's where people like Matthew um, can really be helpful in, in understanding the risk that you are exposed to and how to manage that best. Um, so if there is an increase in, in interest rates by one, two, three percent, um, can you afford that? Can you not afford that? What are the options um, to mitigate that, that risk, really? Um, so, Duncan, perhaps we can move on to the next slide. Um, and really what I was trying to, to highlight here, um, I suppose, is 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 looking at the, the term of the loan um, that you're going after and, and really trying to match that to the investment you're making. Um, so on the screen here, we've got three loan examples of £500,000 at 8% over 10, 15 or 25 years. And if we just look down at that bottom row, we can see the huge contrast in the annual costs um, and under each of those options. Makes sense. Um, if we push it out longer, we're going to pay less because um, we're pushing it out over a longer period. You will potentially pay more interest. But I, keep, I think the key point to take away from this really is matching the investment you're making um, to the term that then you need to take out. So if you've got something like a solar panel investment, then it may pay back in seven to 10 years and therefore a 10 year loan or something slightly less may be suitable. However, if you're buying a farm or pieces of land, then a 25 year term would, would be suitable for that type of asset. And therefore why put yourself under unneeded pressure um, of, of paying it off over 10 years? None of us like um, owing money um, to anybody. However, trying to match um, the asset you're buying to the loan itself, I think is really a fundamental um, point when, when looking at those investments you're going to be making. Um, and then just to touch on, on interest only loans, so sorry, Duncan, if you can go on to, to the next slide. Um, part of the secured loans is, is mainly, you've got two options, I suppose you've got capital repayment um, or, or interest only. Um, and interest only has its place um, with farming, farming businesses. Lots of my farming clients would have interest only loans. 
the advantages there um, are really cash flow. Um, having an interest only loan means you don't have to pay the capital off. Um, so you're just paying interest year to year. Um, and over the past 10 years, that has been uh, had a key cash flow benefit. As interest rates have gone up, um, the benefit has diminished slightly, um, but there's still marginal gains to be made. Um, the disadvantages of interest only debt is, is ultimately where you go from there. So if you can't afford a capital repayment loan and therefore you've gone on to interest only, that the only way you can then um, go go down further is by repaying the capital itself. And, and if you can't afford to do that from the trade, then you're going to have to do that from, from capital sales or, or, or outside um, assets. So therefore, it's just understanding, I suppose, that next point down, the end game, if you're on interest only debt, then to me, it always seems good um, to have a, an end game in, in mind. Do you, do you have a piece of development land, which is, which is going to come in through in the next five to 10 years? Is there an inheritance due? Um, over the, over the next 10 to 15 years, what is that end game to repay that core amount um, of interest only debt? Um, and I think the other thought I always have when you have interest only debt is, is how much can your business have? Um, I used to do a lot of work with with one of the um, southwest um, region um, people from from AMC um, and his sort of rule of thumb for what any farm or landed estates business can have in terms of interest only debt. Um, he had always a bit of an equation. It was the number of acres you had times by one hundred and fifty pound an acre, being your sort of seventy five pound grass key, seventy five pound basic payment scheme. So those numbers might may change a little bit now, um, and then divide that by the interest rate you would get on on a, on an interest only loan. So just to put that in into practice a little bit, if we've got a, a thousand acre farm um, and we times it by that one hundred and fifty pound an acre, we have one hundred and fifty thousand pounds of baseline earnings um, for that business. If we then divide that by a rate of interest um, of 8%, then it comes out that that farming business there could, by rule of thumb, have £1.9 million of interest only debt and sufficiently service that. So that's just sort of a baseline sort of test. Every every single business is, is very different. Um, but when you're looking at what interest only money you could have, that's a rough rule of thumb I've always used for my clients. Okay. So I think over to you, Matthew, on, on mortgages. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just, just finishing that point on interest only, Tom, that um, obviously interest only helps that DSCR calculation that I was going yeah. into earlier, because DSCR takes capital repayment and interest. And if there is no capital repayment, therefore, <laughs> it sweetens the DSCR calculation, yeah. which then in turn will drive a higher loan advance from yeah. the lender's perspective. So um, it's definitely useful particularly with, with farmland purchases, mm. um, which are going to take, you know, maybe 20, 30 years, a generation to, to pay off that capital. So, yeah. um, absolutely. My, my next point, the, the next product was with mortgages, not really one to dwell on, I don't think. A, a mortgage is a type of secured loan, um, but usually involves a new purchase and usually involves a residential property. So not too common in the um, in in the farming arena. Um, the re because there is normally a residential home um, involved, the financial assessment by the lender um, is is extensive and um, is highly driven around the affordability of the loan repayments, with also built in contingency just in case the income streams being used. Um, de um, deplete for some reason because ultimately you you are dealing with someone's residential home and um, uh, this can turn into disaster if if the right affordability analysis and uh, isn't undertaken. Um, important to note that the mortgage lender has the first priority over all security, so there may be a secured loan. Uh, using the same security, using the same security or the same property, but but the mortgage lender will have the first priority. Um, secured loans are often called second mortgages for this reason, because there may be a prime mortgage using the res the primary residence, and then other loans, other secured loans, um, attached to the same security. Um, advantages and disadvantages, obviously. 
it's fairly obviously that the, the interest rate attached to mortgages is is about the cheapest that you'll that you'll find um and also high loan to values can be obtained so more with the residential market you know 90 percent is not uncommon loan to values whereas on commercial property um tends to be more 50 to 70 percent so cheaper rates and and higher loan to values are are on offer the disadvantages will be that you are fundamentally using your residential home and to borrow money for business purposes using the residential um, home, we wouldn't advise unless absolutely necessary. Um, if there is a way to structure a commercial loan using commercial assets, then we, we would highly recommend that was the case. Um, because ultimately, if you default on the loan or something happens with the business, then then your house is is at risk in this process. Over to you, Tom. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and I think mortgages aren't necessary, so that's that common um, in 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 the farming um, world. Um, from a tax perspective, I, th I think the interest allowability is, is often on a case by case, but but I think um, it's ultimately using looking at the purpose of the money you've borrowed for and, and the structure of business to see whether we can get the interest allowable um, on, on, on that debt. Um, and I think one thing just to note, I suppose, on, on mortgages is the term um, and I think that commitment. So so it may be that what most mortgages are, are a two or two to a five year sort of commitment on them. And, and therefore you have got that constant renewal um, and therefore they may have the headline, as, as Matthew said, about being quite cheap. Um, but then by the time you then go through a whole process of, of the remortgage, more arrangement fees like we were with our overdraft earlier over the longer term is probably not the right product, depending on, 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 on how long you need the money for. Um, so, yeah. That was sort of my thoughts on, on mortgages. So back to you, Matthew, on, on high purchase. Okay, so high purchase. Um, so the use of purchase um, or the business investment using high purchase gives you a good deal of flexibility to spread the cost of that purchase over a fixed period of time. The finance company will buy the asset for you. The asset will appear on your balance sheet as an asset, but with an HP li liability. Um, you have a small upfront payment, norm, typically a deposit of 10% or um, a bit more. But then at the end of the repayment period, um, subject to a small option to purchase fee, you will take outright ownership of the asset. So it's a good way of, of spreading the cost um, over a fixed period of time with fixed payments. Um, it's a very common product used to purchase new and used farm equipment and almost any other capital items. We, we talk about hard assets, i.e. wheeled tractors, uh, vehicles, machinery, but there's also the softer assets, um, which may be, you know, uh, bolted to the ground, parlours, uh, um, uh, buildings. Uh, and other fixed equipment, robotics these days, packed house equipment, solar panels, all those things go into more of a softer asset class. They're not, they don't have defined depreciation values and residual values, but they're still uh, identifiable, uh, which makes them suitable for, for higher purchase agreements. The other thing with hyper um, equipment manufacturers often subsidize interest rates and costs um, using high purchase facilities to try and get persuade you to buy their, their new products. Um, funds are primarily secured against the asset of which is being purchased, so enables income to be earned in the future or savings to be made and benefits assessed, um, which can then be used to justify the purchase and the repayments. So there's a forward looking element to, to most of these purchases. Um, advantages, it's very quick and simple, probably often too quick and simple. Um, when you go into a, a, a shiny agricultural dealers to look at new equipment, it, it's scarily easy to, uh, to come away like it is in the car industry, I think. Um, but both new and used equipment can be financed. And we've seen an average term on HP slip out now. Um, it used to be three or five years to pay down equipment on HP. Seven-year deals are now very common. 
and and even we're going into 10 year deals now on longer term things like milking robots um have got 10 year hps which which make that work um so that the, the term is a lot longer than you might think um and also within each year we're matching cash flows um to try and tailor the benefits or the or the new income from the asset to the repayment um occasionally but not very often you can attach a but well, you we see a balloon being attached to the end of an hp now this is a lump of capital which isn't repaid during um the term so it makes the repayments cheaper but uh let's say we don't see that much in agriculture um unless it is a large tractor or combine something that's going to be sold in, at the end of the agreement and there is a defined residual value to it uh, we often see people well we do it's more common to spread the agreement over a longer term to get cheaper annual repayments which are easily serviceable than uh, than put balloons uh, onto agreements so that that's not too uh, common of it with hp particularly at this time of year sole traders and partnerships are using hp to gain to gain capital allowances without the cash outlay from the business so take the tax allowance which tom will come on to i'm sure in a minute um, and obviously with new equipment with manufacturer schemes there is cheap money available not percent finance um, is available on lots of new equipment with hp um, the disadvantages uh, vat has to be paid on signing so people with quarterly VAT returns often leave this can be a problem with larger machine purchases if you buy them at the wrong point in the back quarter and, and the back large amount of that is outlaid for a long period of time um small setup fees and obviously interest are charged which increases the overall cost of the asset as opposed to paying cash so with that to bear in mind um and you will not fully own the asset until the last repayment and that option to purchase at the end has been made. But, but there is always an intent that you are purchasing the goods at the end of the term. Over to you, Tom. Yeah, thanks. And, and yeah, I think the tax benefits, I think, as Matthew just alluded to, um, higher purchases used as, as a main tool for purchasing plant and machinery um, and, and therefore lots of clients have, have, have got um, higher purchases as it does it is a way of not having to use all of your business capital but still be able to, to purchase plant and machinery and get tax relief. Um, I think one thing is it that we do see with a, with a common issue um, is the number of HPs and the amount of money which can be going out a month um, is relatively easy um to, to, to get higher purchase um debt um and therefore these can quite quickly stack up on top of each other um and you can have 10 15 20 000 pound a month going out before before you know it um and that can be quite fundamental um on destroying business cash flow um and perhaps Duncan, if we just go to the, the next slide, um, I thought it would just be useful to consider the cost of a higher purchase versus the cost of a loan and here I'm really thinking about the the financing of a building um so here a building of hundred thousand pounds how does that stack up um on on a hp over five years versus a loan um for 20 years um and as you can see on those bottom lines in in terms of fundamental cash flow cost to the business it costs you half as much to have the bank loan than it does the hp of course you will pay more interest under the loan arrangement however cash flow wise matching the asset you are buying to the right the relevant source of, of finance i think is, is really important um for for farming businesses um and then scenario one of using the hp you're putting yourself under a huge amount of pressure um to repay that over over five years um okay so back to you matthew to yeah. have a look on um leasing leasing so often seen as a complex area compared to hp but just trying to keep it um, high level for, for this discussion is that there are there's, there's two common types of, of leasing agreement a finance lease agreement um, the finance company purchases an asset chosen from a supplier of, of, of the customer um, the, the, as, the finance lease gives the customer access to the assets um, in return for a, a, a higher or a rental payment um, and, and a lease 
a finance lease is divided into effectively a primary period, much like an HP, where where the where the the, the loan or the, the the money is repaid. Uh, there may be a balloon at the end of it, again due from the the, the higher, uh, but at the end of the primary period, the capital outlaid by the finance company plus interest has been repaid, and then a secondary period uh, commences. So if, if the, the the asset is needed still with the lessee, um, a secondary period or peppercorn payment is charged ongoing. So the asset never actually becomes the ownership of the farmer or, or the lessee uh, because this ongoing peppercorn payment is paid to keep the lease running until that person uh, disposes or, uh, or hands back the asset. So compared to an operating lease, the finance company buys the asset again. There's a higher agreement for a fixed period of time. But at the end of that primary period, the asset comes back to either the finance company or the supplier. So there's a defined period of hire with an operating lease. And normally that defined period ends where a residual value has been underwritten by either the finance company or the supplier. So the hire has to end because a residual value needs to be um, realized with the sale of the asset by a, by a supplier or the finance company. Um, you move on to pros and cons. The, the advantages um, of leasing, there's a, you get access to the equipment without the ties of ownership. Mm -hmm. um, the rentals count as an expense in your P&L rather than an asset on the balance sheet. So, so Tom, I'm sure, will, will enlighten, enlighten us on that. Um, the rentals are paid plus VAT per month, per quarter, per, per annum. So the VAT comes into more of a it's more in a, um, a cash flowed situation rather than being paid up front as well as with HP. And this is we see this quite common where people are on the uh, quarterly VAT returns. They may set their lease payments to a quarterly frequency. So they pay every three months um, and then claim VAT back on a on a quarterly return. So there's um, that advantage. Um, obviously not big outlays and hiring equipment rather than buying keeps cash reserves uh, within the business and effectively fixed rental agreement, fixed rental amounts. Um, uh, cash load into the business. For, for assets, operating leases come into its own again now for assets, which may be undesirable. We talk about without the ties of ownership. Well, there are some assets that maybe you don't want to be tied with ownership. Um, operating leases have become quite popular again, particularly with things like electric vehicles. Um, we have some large corporate customers now who just don't want the residual liability of an electric car or a battery operated um, piece of equipment. So by using an operating lease, you're forcing the residual value or the disposal cost of that equipment back onto the supplier or the finance company. So there are instances where ownership is not desirable, maybe. Um, the disadvantages of just say it again with, you know, the, you don't own the asset and with either leases, you, you will never own the asset. Um, and there could be extra costs come in on a secondary period of a finance lease if, if that lease goes beyond its primary term. Yeah. Um, so tax wise on, on leasing, um, operating leases, as Matthew said, you've got your rentals, which go for your profit and loss um, and a tax deductible um, as, as they're paid throughout that lease period. Um, finance leases are somewhat a little bit funnier um, on the accounting um, of those. Typically, they're treated as an asset and then the depreciation is, is allowable as an expense for tax purposes. Um, that ends up working out as being the rental. Um, so, so it's a bit of a long winded way around to, to get to the same outcome. Um, um, I guess what to watch out for, one from a tax perspective, um, I suppose if you're changing, so you're going from having 
um, items on HP to then looking to lease. Um, potentially in that first year of disposal, um, you might end up with a, a taxable profit from the sale of, the, of those items and then not have the reinvestment you're normally used to. Um, so you could have a, a year where there's a bit of a balancing charge um, for capital allowance points. Um, so worth discussing with your advisors before you change your overall policy um, on, on leasing and higher purchase. Um, and I think commercially as well, it's just weighing up what's right um, from a cost perspective between that finance lease, operating lease and HP. Because by the time you look at residual values, what things are worth at the end, is it really cost effective to have an operating lease um, in reality when, when you get to the end of it, you have nothing um, to, to return. So case by case, I think on, on that one. But when you're looking at, say, like fleets of tractors and things like that, then I think it's important to look at the various different options and look at the pros and cons um, of, of each. Um, so back to you, Matthew, for um, sailing HP back. The sale and HP back, sale and lease back. So this, this is using the, the higher purchase and the lease doc, the finance lease documents we've already discussed, but actually um, the borrower has already purchased the goods um, and within a set period, usually sort of within three or six months um, after the purchase, a higher purchase or a finance lease can be obtained against those assets um, to replenish working capital, um, which may have been, or overdraft, which may have been used up um, in the initial purchase. Um, so the borrower is the supplier of the asset to the finance company. So the borrower sells the asset to the finance company and then buys it back on a higher purchase or buys it back on a, on a sale and lease back. Um, an established farming business or the, the main the good thing about the, the farming business is that we will have you know, fleets of vehicles and equipment, plant and machinery, um, and even land and buildings, which um, you can release huge amounts of equity from. Um, it amazes us the amount of unencumbered or equity sitting around farms these days on, on high value equipment, um, which can be utilized to quickly um, release, release cash. And, and there's no new, no new purchase required. So normally with traditional HP, um, you have to go out and buy something new in order to obtain the HP, whereas this route, we can use HP on existing um, assets. The refinance is becoming a really useful tool in the farm finance sort of toolbox um, to, to say freeing up working capital on assets that are already being used in the business and the new loan facility or the new HP can then be um, um, sort of modelled around the useful life of that asset um, and actually the project that the money is going to be used on. So it can be cash flows very closely. Um, pros and cons. The main advantage um, with this is that if you want to you can buy the asset and then figure out afterwards how you want to finance it, you don't have to make that decision uh, on the day. So how much finance do we want? Which product do we want? Um, can all be decided after the event. Um, because it's a higher purchase or a lease agreement as opposed to a secured loan, that it's fairly quick and easy uh, and low cost to, um, to put in place. And again, the loan can be tailored, number one, to the depreciation of the asset that's being used and also um, to, the, to the purpose of the loan for which the money's being used. Um, the disadvantages, we're locking up assets that are obviously unencumbered within the business. Um, and if you use a sale and lease back product, then effectively you, you've got an asset that you own today, but then you won't own if you put it on a lease agreement with a finance company. So there are some disadvantages. Yeah, and I think from my perspective, just from a tax head, I suppose, um, sale and HP back used to loan the assets, so therefore there's sort of no tax consequences in terms of sale. But as Matthew just alluded to there, on the sale and lease back, you do have a disposal of an asset. So if it's a tractor and you're leasing that back, then you have a disposal um, for income tax or corporation tax purposes for income perspective. If it's the sale of 
land, um, then potentially to capital gains tax and then the taxes that follow um, there. So I think it's important, especially on the sale and lease back, really, to, to get advice before you before you get um, too far with those types of agreements, um, especially in particular sale and lease back, because then you're potentially losing control of said items. What's the impact for that on your business? Um, are there other options to, to raise money um, rather than the sale and lease back arrangement? Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Right. Um, just want to touch briefly on grants um, before we wrap up. Um, grants are a sum of money, as, as I'm sure all of you know, given by businesses, um, given to businesses by governments, other organisations or philanthropists. They're usually non-repayable um, and they don't usually require security. And importantly, they don't require um, the business to give any away, away any of its equity when they take them. But um, you've got to remember that there are um, quite a, a range of grants available at any one time to businesses in the UK. Um, and you've got to do your footwork and be certain that the grant that you're considering is right for you and your business before you start down that route. Firstly, you've got to consider why you're looking for a grant. Is it to assist you in a project which you've already got planned? Um, it's essential that you don't try and design your project to fit a grant just to get that grant. Um, you should only really seek grant funding to help you achieve your goals on a project that you've already got planned. If you do the reverse and you actually seek a, a design a project to fit a grant that you'd found, um, that poor alignment to either your existing business or to the true interests and goals of you and your um, business can actually lead to project failure very easily. Um, and if that happens and you've raised commercial funding as part of that project, because most um, grants don't give you 100% funding, um, that could lead to an expensive loan um, and repayments, which if the project has failed, has got to be serviced by your existing business. Um, and it may be that that is just that little bit too much. So you've got to consider that risk there. So assuming that you're confident in the project that you've got, um, you need to find a grant that you're eligible for and do your research on that chosen grant first. It's essential that you do that. Um, consider what the chances are of a successful application. Um, you don't want to spend a lot of time chasing a grant if actually the, the chance of a successful application is very, very slim. Um, you could use up more time and money and your competitive advantage by pursuing that um, than you'll actually gain from it. Check the objectives of the grant. Do they actually match your objectives? Um, you need to draw up a business plan and be certain that the project is workable within the constraints that may be imposed by a grant. The majority of grants require the business to put in quite significant funds in addition to the grant money. Um, and that money you need to find either out of your own savings or um, through a loan of some description. Um, so consider what the actual impact of that on you would be. And also check that the grant's um, timeframe fits with your needs. Can you complete a project within the time constraints of the grant? Often many grants have to be um, spent within a certain time frame, and not all projects can be fitted in um, to that time frame without actually having a dramatic effect and are on the business um, and the project that you've got in mind. Consider um, what will happen if you fail to complete all of the um, constraints of the, the project, uh, of the um, grant, and the project isn't actually completed in time or indeed at all. What are the penalties? Would you have to repay any or all of the funds that you already received? If so, could you afford to? Um, and if for some reason you didn't fit the project in within the time frame of the grant, but you can finish the project, could you actually afford to um, finish the project without that grant, um, at least in a, a scaled down format, if the grant money is withheld for any reason? They're all factors that actually you do need to consider because if you've gone halfway through a project or, or further um, and the money is withheld for whatever reason, um, it could have a very significant impact on your business. Matthew, if I can 
hand over to you at that point. Yeah, but I've been reiterating, I think, Duncan, what, what you've already said. I mean, we the grant will never cover 100% of the entire investment you're making. Um, we see time again, there's hidden costs and the contingency is required to every project. Um, there may be some civils, bills, legal costs, consultants, etc. So there's, there's always a contingency required, uh, even on 100% of the... Um, the investment and the other point you make um delay and timing is key we often we particularly with supply chains and locking in steel price and and things like this you need to put upfront deposits substantial deposits to suppliers um which is a, a payments well ahead of when the grant money will be released so um timing to keep the project on on track uh, is key. We we will always look at any application involving a grant. Um, we'll take out the grant funds and see if the um, project is viable if the grant fails. So that there's always a prudent, um, tested sort of forecast, if you like, on on if the grant money doesn't come through and debt, interest bearing debt, is used in its place to fund the project, is it still viable and giving adequate returns? So that's a good, that's something we do as a lender um, and, the, and the borrower should, we would share with the borrower. Um, additional sources of funds, um, the grant may not come through at all. It may be at a lower level than expected. So putting secured loans into you know, using land or buildings to raise secured loans in order to supplement the extra money required or, or if a lower grant is awarded is, is quite common. Um, the one thing I did want to point out is the, the improving farm productivity grants, the IFP, at the moment, they're quite clear that higher purchase and leasing cannot be used as part of that project. Um, the assets need to be purchased outright um, as part of that grant process. So um, we are seeing people raise secured loans in order to help that because um, making these purchases using overdraft and cash reserves can be a, um, a dangerous occupation. So uh, we can refinance or sell and lease back, sell and HP back assets after they've gone through the, the purchasing um, procedure on equipment and also use secured loans um, to supplement um, grant funded projects. Okay, Tom, do you have any? Yeah, I think, add... I think the only point I was gonna add on to it and it very much fills in from the two points you've made, I think, especially with the countryside stewardship, um, typically if your spend is over 50,000 pounds, then you need an accountant's letter to accompany your application. So therefore that pre-consideration when you know you're going to have big capital expenditure of over 50,000, whether that be on fencing or various other things under the scheme, I think is really important so that your advisor accountant can, can fill those letters out um, with the information straight away and, and keep up to timings um, on the arrangements there. Um, so really important to understand how you're going to fund that deficit in between the application, the work being done and the subsequent money um, be, being received. Um, so working with Matthew and others um, to, to find those, fund those holes um, in, in the meantime, isn't it? Okay, thank you. Um, we have um, run on a little bit longer than expected, but just one quick question for you, um, Matthew. Um, what are you finding at the moment the most common reason for farms raising money under secure loans is? Uh, and what's the average size of that loan? Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, we um, There's a lot of um, consolidation uh, applications coming in. So, so there's an opportunity for a diversification or some new money to go into the business. But we hit these affordability buffer calculations. And so you look back at the historic loans which are in place in the business, and some of those, if they've been, um, you know, some of the, some of them are on higher fixed rates or, or standard variable rates, which which are higher than can be put in place now. So I'd say the most common application is facilitated by a new requirement for cash for a, 
for a diversification, but we're ending up picking up some other debt and consolidating it all into one new facility um, and refixing. Because as Tom's graph showed at the beginning of the um, of the session, longer term fixed rates are actually becoming quite reasonable again now. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm conscious that we have actually run out of time, for which I uh, apologise. Um, very useful insight, particularly onto the insight onto the secure business loan side and, and the leasing and, and higher purchase and the um, buyback methods and, and the impact on your accounts as well from, from you, Tom. So I'd like to thank both Matthew and Tom for their time today. Um, and um, if you could please give us um, scan the QR code on there and give us feedback for the survey. There are a range of, of um, further um, visits and, and webinars coming up or on our um, website. The slides and recording for this will be put up on the website and um, sent out to you, I, I believe, at, um, as soon as possible. Um, and if you do have any questions about any of the content that was raised during this, please do contact the regional team um, and then uh, at the Southwest office and then we can um, talk with Matthew and, and Tom and get um, your queries and questions answered as quickly as possible. Um, with that, I'd like to draw the uh, webinar to a close and thank you all for attending.